thank you very much, Helmut. Not uh, in the least for, for inviting Ivan Krastev, because he's an, a very old friend of mine. So I'm particularly pleased to greet all of you and also greet our speaker, because uh, in uh, 10 years that I have been here, this is our second East Euro speaker from Eastern Europe at either commencement or graduation. And I was the previous one 10 years ago when, when we joined. More than this, actually, and I have in common with, uh, with Ivan Krastev, because we apparently are part of the same generation. A generation older than you, as you, I will reveal immediately, because we were 25 or around in 1989, the year when the wall fell. And that places us a little bit in, into our generation, but it also shows you that we had quite extraordinary lives. Now, I just want to show you, to give a little bit of background of Ivan Karastev and who it is. How, do, how did he arrive to be one of the 50 people whom New York Times asked to be a regular op-ed writer, which is probably the highest kind of achievement in terms of having a public voice that somebody can, can reach? Well, you have to understand that prior to 1989, when we were your age or younger, we didn't have any television sets. We didn't have any internet. We had no MTV. We had no Netflix. We actually had nothing, you know, but a lot of time on our hands. And what do you think we did with that time, you know? Well, what did we do? We read. Of course, we read a lot of Karl Marx because we had to, you know. We were, I, I was in Romania and he was in Bulgaria. But you know, that's not as bad as that because if I had not read him then, you know, I mean, who knows if I ever had the time to read him. But we didn't even, you know, only read Marx. Okay, we also read Kant. We also read a lot of poetry. We also read a lot of literature. We read practically everything because there was nothing else to do. And we also wrote a lot, right? Since there was nothing new that you can write, everything was censored. So we had to read ourselves, our new writings produced by ourselves and by our friends, right? So we all belong to this small literary circle. So the first time I heard Ivan Krastev sp spoken of, somebody told me he's an accomplished poet. Now, I know I embarrass him mentioning that, but he's actually an accomplished poet in Bulgaria, and even he probably haven't written poetry in years. If you had asked somebody whom I was, you know, 25 years ago, they would have oh, she's this uh, playwright who won this big award for, for a play, right? And now we try to hide this from our Wikipedia web pages unsuccessfully because, you know, <laughs> we pull it out and some people pull it back. It's full of entrepreneurs out there, of, of other people's biographies. No way of getting rid of them. Just don't believe everything which is on Wikipedia, you know, check, check on us. <laughs> so what I want to say is that Ivan has the background of an intellectual, and I think this is what makes his op-ed so fascinating, because he speaks always and he thinks always from outside the box. However, he's not a French-type intellectual, and I would say that this is the difference between us. He's not the intellectual who gets, you know, who likes lost causes, or what people, some people would call lost causes, right? He always told me, don't go into this, you know, anti-corruption thing, you know, it's, it's really dangerous. And it's first for you, and second for politics, you know, because politics is inherently corrupt, and if people start questioning it so dramatically, I mean, better discuss left and right than and corruption, <laughs> anti-corruption, it's actually safer, you know. And the other, the other topic on which I have never seen, I mean, the other great you know, lost causes, hopefully not lost, you know, I've never seen Ivan opening a big meeting. I've seen him opening everything. He's the most sought after speaker in the world. His last book had reviews in literally everywhere, you know, Times, Guardian, Wall Street Journal, name it. But I've never seen Ivan opening a climate change conference. So the same as with corruption, I think Ivan is a realist is someone who actually focuses on reachable, attainable goals and actually warns people, warns people around, not that they shouldn't do what they do, I've never seen Ivan prescriptive telling people do this or do that, but just warns them of what is attainable. In other words, he's the you know, critical, lucid, central European intellectual. And I got two big ideas from Ivan in, in the, in the length of time, and I also spotted two great qualities, and I'll just mention this and give the floor to him. His first great idea was actually in an article about Bulgaria. The article was called Democracy Without Choice, and when you read it first, you thought that it's just about Bulgaria. He basically remarked that Bulgarian voters, if it's left or right running in elections, are actually in the end confronted with the same set of policies. At the time, that set of policies were, you know, IMF drafted uh, Washington consensus policies, 
And when you read that at the first time, you would say, well, okay, but why should the rest of us care about this sad Bulgarian story that, uh, you know, these people have elections, but they really are confronted with similar sets of policies. But you may have noticed that meanwhile, this has become rather general, right? And this is what explains why voters these days vote for populists or they go for impossible alternatives such as Brexit, because what they want, they simply cannot find in this consensus among political elites. So democracy without choice by now, I think, has a huge outstanding number of citations. And definitely everybody learned, meanwhile, that it's not a story about Bulgaria. The second uh, important lesson that I learned uh, from Ivan, and that he developed along the years, and I'm sure you're gonna listen a little bit of it today, and for sure it's in this short, extraordinarily witty book that I recommend to everyone to read, his latest book, After Europe, is a story about meritocracy and elite. And I think this is particularly relevant because we are very proud that we create a meritocracy here. And as you have heard our president say, I mean, we welcome you here into the best networks, the best education, and the best futures possible. However, we are in the moment when people really don't look up at us so much as sort of look at us with some envy and blame us for some of the bad things which happened in the past 10 years. Now we believe we are blameless. We believe nothing of what went wrong with globalization was brought by us, by, by elites. But what I liked in Ivan's works is that he sort of tells us that we elites have to be more self-critical. We have to be more humble. We have to understand that elites sometimes get replaced. I mean, very close to our times, we have seen in Turkey how Mr. Erdogan replaced the secular elite with his own people, and nobody said anything. It just happened under our eyes, and you can just discover that one day those people who were there and we relied on them, they were pro-European and whatever, might be gone. And the same might happen with us. This warning of Ivan is extraordinary. He's one of the few people who dug deep into the intellectual history of meritocracy. Where did this come about? And I think it's, this is really something that you should learn well, when you are at the beginning of your career and you prepare to go out there and fix other people's countries or your own, depending. And uh, I don't know where you will end up. You know, we, we prepare you for both possibilities. <laughs> And we consider every country where you go, our country, we are ready to you know, send our battalions everywhere, intellectual battalions, of course. If one's two qualities uh, that have by now come out is first, his extraordinary relevance. Ivan has been educated in Oxford. Among his professors have been people like uh, Tim Garton Ash or Stephen Holmes, but I do not think Ivan has a professor or a mentor per se, because his second quality is that he's extremely original, and how do this blend together? You know, his policy relevance, he managed to keep it by actually staying out of academia. I would say that Ivan is the most sought after by academia, non-academic that exists, because he simply avoids everything which makes academia redundant for policy, you know. If you've seen these days, we are creating institutes to speak to the gap of relevance between uh, academic uh, research and the policy world. Well, you don't need this. I mean, in the area, you are just read Krastev and there is gonna be no gap because he just is not after advancing his career. He's just after the truth, saying the truth, going beyond the wall, saying things that maybe other people see, but they don't have the courage to, to speak out. And his originality comes from the fact that he doesn't go with the crowd. He is what I would call a paradigm killer. I mean, in his entire life, I think that he always was the first to say, oh, this is becoming too general. This might have been truth at some point, but it's really you know, burdensome that we all share this view. Time to go past, time to think of what happens next, time to think of what is the next challenge. And this is why I think that uh, the, his book After Europe should not at all be seen as a neuroseptic book. It's simply the book of someone who has no boundaries on the freedom to think. I am very happy to give you Ivan Krastev. Dear colleagues, and my interest is to stop here. <laughs> uh, so you can, uh, first of all, thank you very much. And uh, uh, of course, not much of this is true, uh, uh, <laughs> but I was very uh, happy to listen to it. Uh, 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 but I want to start with something that uh, I, I'm genuinely uh, really privileged to be here, and this is for three different reasons. One is because I have friends and because I have a very high respect for the institution, I have been here before. 
Uh, secondly, because I want to see who are those courageous people who decided to enroll in public policy these days. <laughs> because it is slightly like basically enrolling in theology in the 1920s in Soviet Union. <laughs> if you read basically, if you read uh, newspapers, you're going to see that the deaths of experts and total mistrust to institutions and others. So from this point of view, to be a policy expert is not what it used to be. And you need the courage uh, to do this. But certainly, and this is serious, because I always believe, probably wrongly, that Hert is one of these Hirschmannian institutions, coming from a tradition of some of one of my intellectual heroes, somebody who was born in this city, Albert Hirschman. And from this point of view, this is a very important tradition which I unfortunately believe is in danger today. Hirschman was an incredible social scientist and there is a beautiful biography of him which was published uh, lately called World Philosopher. I do believe that if I'm the first person from whom you hear the name, this is going to be the major benefit. Uh, from your being here, but he had a very important, in my view, perspective and something to do very much with the time we live in. He was born in the beginning of the century. He was a German Jew. He used to say that I'm from the generation that does not have problem with our identities. We have a problem with our identity papers. Who run after uh, Europe. He went to the United States. He made a career. He wrote several, in my view, really important books that are going to stay, including his classical Exit Voice and Loyalty. But better than many others, he represents something that I really do believe in danger these days, and this is the culture of reformism. Reformism understands his interest in small ideas and policy paradoxes. The idea that you are going to improve the world, not basically trying to imagine what is going to happen the day after, but also trying to see how it functions. Totally curious person, he made the motto of his life that I want to prove Hamlet wrong. His idea was that uh, unlike Shakespeare, Hamlet, which was always accused of uh, being unable to act because he has doubts, he believes that doubts, and particularly basically asking yourself and trying to test uh, some of the prevailing uh, uh, paradigms is not, uh, 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 does not lead to inaction, it leads to action. And from this point of view, I do believe Kirschman was very important because I was interested these days. And of course, it's obviously we're living in a period which is not easy to be described when you're living it. Probably in 10 or 15 years, we'll know better what it was. But if I was interested what people who in a certain way are running the world, political leaders, technology gurus, what they're reading. And here is the news. Politicians basically read history and biographies. I mean, when they're not reading, of course, policy papers, but policy paper is not reading. Technology people are reading science fiction stories. Normally 20th century science fiction story. The two of them, for different reasons, there is not much reformism there. History books, particularly when it's a good history, is going to tell you that what is happening today has happened before. Uh, uh, and there is also a very strong idea that everything that exists now is worth preserving. So kind of attachment to status quo is one thing that you can see very strongly in the political world. On the other side, if you go to the technological gurus, and I was recently in Stanford and so on, and they don't want to reform the world. They always want to start from the beginning to go to the moon, to go to an island, basically to come with a different world. Uh, paradoxically, the idea of revolution that used to be political 100 years ago now emigrated to the technological world. I still believe that probably improving the world makes sense. <laughs> and from this point of view, all this uh, tradition of Hirschman is critically important, but it is not ready to be sustained. These days when people are looking for radical changes and expectations are huge, for good and for bad. I'm saying this because in this uh, uh, 30 minutes that I have, and I, I really uh, see this as a huge privilege, I'll try to touch on two issues that are important for me. And we always have this, uh, of course, disagreement on corruption, so I'm not going to talk about corruption, but keep it that corruption is slightly like Nokia. It connects people. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, but, but, uh, but I want to talk, uh, to touch on two things that in my view are quite important to understand uh, the current state of Europe. One is, I'm going to argue, 
is that migration crisis, the refugee crisis, much more than the financial crisis of 2010, 2009, is going to be the critical element for remaking and reshaping the European Union, and not simply because of the resurgence of the East-West divide, but for some other things that I'm going to touch on. And secondly, I'm going to touch to the problem of meritocracy. And the question which I'm going to ask is a simple one. Why people who are ready to give all their money to send their kids to study in the best schools of the world then do not want to be governed by people who graduated these schools? Why basically this Michael Groove's people have had enough of experts comes from? What is the problem with meritocracy and not simply with this or other meritocracy? But let's start in order to give you my perspective of why I do believe we are in a moment in which it's kind of a, a critical junction. There is a beautiful uh, novel by José Saramago, which is called Death with Interruptions. And it tells the story of a country in which suddenly people stop dying. In January, nobody died. In February, nobody died. In March, nobody died. Certain type of euphoria captured society. But after celebrating for the while, certain type of anxiety and nervousness appeared. First were the insurance companies. <laughs> they, they said, listen, if nobody's dying, we have a problem. And then basically comes the church. If nobody's dying, nobody can resurrect. <laughs> and then there were those people that were taking care of a very sick uh, uh, people, parents and others, they said, but is it going to be like this all the time? So probably there was a Bulgarian involved, but uh, uh, they created, uh, they created a, a smuggling channel in order basically uh, uh, to smuggle these sick people to the neighboring country where people were still dying. At the end of the book, the prime minister go to the king and said, your majesty, if we don't start dying, we don't have a future. I'm saying this because this is a story of something that was extremely desired by the humanity. Something which was a dream that turned nightmare. And I'm saying this because in a certain way what we witness today is a radical change in the way people start to, preserve, uh, to perceive globalization. Globalization, opening of the borders, destruction of the walls, was a dream. And at the same time, basically the same people that have been celebrating it started to see this as a problem. If interdependence just a decade ago was perceived as a source of security, now it starts to be perceived as the source of insecurity. Just to see these two different modes in which the globalization is perceived, just imagine two figures, the tourist and the refugee. The tourist is the globalization that we like. They come, they smile, they spend, they go back they doesn't bother us with the problems of the world. The refugee, who could be an ex-yesterday's tourist, he comes, he stays, but also he brings with him the problems of the bigger world. And from this point of view, this type of a separation between the world of tourists and uh, the world of refugees, starting to perceive uh, the globalization very much through the migrants and refugees than uh, through the, figu uh, through the uh, figure of the uh, a tourist is something that I do believe is very important at this moment because suddenly things that we have been really proud with, we started to doubt. And this is why the migration crisis has an effect on Europe, which was similar to the effect that 9-11 has on the American society. In literary terms, 3,000 people died in New York. This is 400,000 died in Iraq. Hundred thousands are dying in Syria, but it pushed American society to see the world differently and their role in the world differently. And something like this, I do believe, we are facing in Europe today. And this is why the migration crisis has such a strong impact, which cannot be reduced to the people coming to Europe. It can be explained, in my view, in a much broader context. And I tend to view the migration crisis, and here I'm going to use migrant and refugee as a synonymous, nevertheless, of course, in legal terms, they're very different and so on. But for the point which I want to make is that this basically really pushed Europeans 
to reperceive the world in which we had been living. And this is going to have a political consequences for us. There was a 1981 was the first year when the famous World Value Survey started. And then they have been also studying the happiness of the different nations. In 1981, uh, economic development and basically economic welfare did not correlate with stated happiness. In 1981, Nigerians were as happy as the West Germans were. 20 years later, this has changed. The Nigerians were as happy as their GDP is going to predict. What has happened? Something very simple. Nigerians got television screens. <laughs> they learned to see how the West Germans live, this time the Germans. So from this point of view, one of the major things that globalization brought on the world is a totally changing frame of comparisons. People are not comparing anymore their lives with the lives of their parents or with their lives even from 15, 20 years ago. They're comparing their life with those who are living best in the world. They're seeing this, it's very easy to see this, and as a result of it, and this is uh, my argument, not surprisingly, migration can turn to be the 21st century revolution. But this is a revolution without communist manifesto. It does not need big political leaders. It's not a collective action. This is just one person on one family with uh, their mobile phone. And this is critically important because people start to realize that if you want to change radically your life, better change your country than to change your government. Uh, and this is quite important because in a fascinating book called uh, The Burst uh, Place Lottery shows that the biggest predicator of how you're going to live your life, how much money you're going to have in your life, is not how well educated your parents are, but where you have been born. Better be born in Germany. Better be born in Sweden. So from this point of view, you come up with a situation in which, first, you have an individualization uh, of the political action, and you have a lot of people who decided to change their lives in one generation. And in order to do it, basically, migration comes as a major strategy. But this is changing a lot in European politics. It's changing a lot in European politics first, because most of these people want to come to places like Europe or Canada or the United States. But secondly, because it puts under question some of the major structural divides through which we're trying to explain our politics. One of the interesting effects of the migration crisis was the kind of a total problematization of the left-right divide in Europe. If you see how the blue-collar workers voted on the elections in the last three years, you're going to see that the majority of them voted on the far right. The movement from the left, center left to the far right was one of the kind of most important migration that we see. It was not migration of people, but migration of votes. Around more than 85% of the blue collar workers in Austria on the second round of the presidential elections voted for the candidate of the Freedom Party. And I don't believe that it is as dramatic uh, uh, in Germany, but you can see it in, in France and so on. Why? Because in the post-Marxist post left, with no idea of a global revolution, and there is no idea of the avant-garde role of the working class, does not have reason to be internationalist. So we have a kind of a new divide coming, and uh, David Goodhart, a uh, sociologist uh, uh, from London, in my view, uh, very nicely framed it, said, this is the divide between people from anywhere and people from somewhere. Uh, and this type of a perspective on the road is making uh, uh, the, the way we can understanding political institutions, our own political life, voting behaviors and others uh, quite differently. Just give you one example how much uh, uh, intellectual uh, challenge the migration could be. In the 1970s, it was very characteristic for the left to claim that, for example, some tribes in India they have the right to resist globalization because they have the right to defend their way of life. They have the right to defend their way of life. Now this is the argument coming from the right who said, listen, what about people in Upper Austria? Do do not have the right to defend their way of life? 
Uh, I'm saying this because in a strange way we're going to be in a position to reread some of the major books. Because European project, more than anything else, is rooted in the intellectual tradition of the Enlightenment. But in its radical form, the international tradition of Enlightenment presupposes two things. Either that people can travel, live, and have their rights nevertheless where they are, or they're living in such a nice place that nobody's going to be interested to leave these places. Both of these options are not easy to imagine today. Neither we can imagine that we are going to have the rights which are totally divorced from our citizenships, nor we're going to imagine that in the world the development is going to be so spectacular that basically uh, uh, people are going to want uh, uh, to stay in their country. So we are now facing a situation which is very different and it was not by accident that East-West divide reemerged so much and people started to talk about the empathy walls. Uh, because in a certain way what the migration crisis produced in Eastern Europe, and this is very important, this is one of these famous paradoxes of Hirschman. Listen, in Eastern Europe you have a very hostile anti-migration sentiment which really shaped politics. What you don't have is migrants. This is, this is simply true, it's factually true. Which does not mean that you cannot reduce this to the manipulation of one or another political leader. What the refugee crisis did, and don't forget, we're talking about the small ethnic nations and societies, it basically unlocked their demographic imagination. Let's give you an example of my own country, Bulgaria. Bulgaria now is around 7.5 million people living in the country. 2.1 million Bulgarians are living abroad and basically, as you can imagine, what kind of percent of the population has left for the last 25 years. If the UN projections are right, demographic projections, in 30 years, Bulgaria is going to lose 27% of its population. Suddenly, Bulgarians discovered their mortality as an ethnic group. Suddenly, you start to ask yourself a question, if in 100 years anybody is going to speak our language, who is going to read my poetry? Uh, 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 <laughs> Uh, I'm saying this because this type of questions are critically important. And when I do believe that we can argue that we are living in a period in which there is a radical change. Radical change is not characterized by fact that we have a different answers to the questions of yesterday. What has changed is the question. Till 10 years ago, the major question that European Union and the West in general was facing was how we can transform the world. And the people like Professor Ishinger here, and so this was it. How we are going to transform our neighbors? How we are going to transform the world? If you read carefully uh, the political statements of the last years, the question now is how we are not going to allow the outside world to transform us? How we are going basically to keep the nature of our political uh, regimes? How we are going to do it? Be it from immigration or hacking and so on, what came in the United States? This is a different question. And in a certain way, I do believe from this point of view, it's up to your generation, because I very much agree with Selena, is going to face the generation. Our generation has only one advantage, but important one. We know how fragile everything political is. I was 25 years old when the wall collapsed. Being Bulgarian, not a Pole, believe me, nevertheless that the communist power has lost legitimacy, it looked as stable as the mountain near Sofia. You cannot imagine that basically this can collapse. In six weeks, it was over. Just something that till yesterday was unthinkable became inevitable. And I do believe that this time of a very radical changes is something that we have experienced. And to be honest, this is why it makes us more anxious about certain developments in the European Union. This is why I'm not so easily buying uh, some of the highly optimistic things that it's enough, the recovery of the economy to come and so on. When certain type of processes start, the level of fragility and vulnerability is very high. So I'm, I'm, I want to stop here, but I just want to prepare you for the fact that you are going to be the generation which even during your studies is going to face, uh, to face a challenge of a major, major intellectual uh, 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 paradigms that we all have been working with. For example, how the migration crisis affected the human rights discourse. 
human rights discourse was something that basically shaped the way of understanding the world in the last 25 years. And now somebody, one of the key voices of the human rights uh, movement like Michael Ignatieff is going to say, listen, when it comes to immigration, probably it's better to speak in terms of hospitality because the problem with the rights is that it should be divorced from the capacity of the government. But you cannot in a certain way divorce it when it comes to things like refugees, when it comes to immigration. And I do believe that all these questions are going to come to you. And then I move to the second point which I want to do, and this is very much about meritocracy and why I do believe that it's not the crisis of democracy, but the crisis of meritocratic idea that is at the heart of some of the problems that Europe is facing. European Union was never kind of a classical democracy for reasons that you know better than anybody else. But I was some two years ago in Greece, and I saw the former minister of finance, George Papa Constantino, and he told me something that really struck me. He said, Ivan, for the last one year, I have not left, I never went to a restaurant because I was afraid that people are going to boo at me, that they're going to basically be violent towards me. I was in a kind of a house arrest. I was living in the car. You cannot simply get out. People were so angry. And listen, George Papa Constantino is not one of the Greek politicians that you have read a lot about. It's none of the big political families that have been running the country for the last hundred years. He was a classical meritocrat, a boy from a humble background who got a good education, I do believe, in the United Kingdom. On the basis of these educations, he demonstrated policy skills. This was the reason George Papandreou invited him uh, to, uh, to join the government. And also, he's not uh, known for being personally corrupt. So this is not all these explanations. And the major accusation against him was that he was the person who told the European Commission how big is the debt and the deficit of Greece. He basically revealed the dirty secret. Where is the problem? Why people became so mistrustful towards the meritocratic elites, and meritocratic elites I'm basically going to define as people that have their power based on the knowledge. So it's very much through education. Why this is a general tendency? This is not a Greek problem. Look at the United States. One of the interesting stories, and from this point of view, the Trump uh, is a great example. Americans are not angry at rich people. Americans are angry at rich people who graduated Ivy League universities. And one thing that President Trump succeeded to hide during the campaign was not so much his connections with the Russians, it was very much the fact that he has graduated Wharton Business School. He behaved as if he basically came directly from Brooklyn. Uh, I, 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 I'm saying this because it is quite important. Why in a world in which we all are going to agree that problems are becoming much more complex, that people basically need a lot of knowledge to understand what is going on. Why then? People, and I'm talking about the normal, average, reasonable people, are becoming so mistrustful, exactly towards the educated elites. If 10 years ago in Bulgaria to speak a foreign language was an advantage if you're running for politics, these days it is not. Speaking a foreign language does not help you. And I'm going in a minute to tell you why. I'm saying this because when we talk about meritocracy and it looks as a kind of a paradox for us, uh, Michael Young, the British sociologist who in 1958 uh, uh, introduced the term meritocracy, was not going to be so much surprised. Because for him, meritocracy was not a utopia. It was an anti-utopia. Because he believes that meritocratic societies Nevertheless, they talk about education and we're talking about the equal opportunity. In fact, are societies which are creating an increasing and very unequal societies. And secondly, these are societies that are producing an arrogant winners and angry losers. Just to tell you why our talk that education by its own is leveling and producing more uh, equality, an example which I'm sure that you're going highly to appreciate in Shanghai these days, because there is a huge pressure for getting in a good schools. One of the leading private schools in Shanghai did not make simply tests for the students that want to join, but also for their parents. They would want to be sure that they're going to have not only intelligent students, but they're coming from the intelligence families. 
So in a strange way, you have this reproduction of a certain type of a divide in the society. But what is even more important is, unlike many other elites, meritocratic elites do not have the feeling that they own anything to anybody because they succeeded according to the rules. In a way, there was a test. I did it, you didn't do it. Why I should feel sorry for you? We have an opportunity, both of us. And this is, I do believe, quite important, and this, in my view, explains also some of the attraction of the voters to some of the populist leaders. Because the other important thing about uh, uh, this type of experience of meritocratic society is people like Rawls believe that it's better to be a loser in a fair society than to be a loser in a fair society because the very idea that the rules are fair is going to make it easier for you uh, to live with your loss. Here, I do believe psychologically, probably, he's not totally right. Better be a loser in an unfair society because you can blame the system. Because you can explain your failure not through your own individual failures, but through the failures of the system. Because otherwise, you should own your failure in a dramatic way. I'm saying this because the second characteristics of uh, this uh, societies today, uh, this meritocratic elites today, is that they're extremely mobile. You're going to graduate here, and you can decide. You can work in Berlin, but you can decide to work in Singapore. Your competence is convertible. You are not kind of, nevertheless, from where you come, you are not going to be kind of a rooted to a certain place. And in a certain way, this is one of the major advantages of the bigger world. From the point of view of the voters, and particularly those who does not perceive them as winners, the fact that you can go anywhere means that you're not going to stay with them. The fact that when there is a crisis, you have an exit option and they don't have. And this is one of the differences between these meritocratic elites in the global world and some other elites. For example, if you see the landed aristocracy, this is not like the bankers. They cannot take their land and go with it to Hawaii. They should stay there. They're totally dependent on the people who are there. If you go even the communist elites, they had a huge privileges in their own system, but if they decided to cross the border, they're not going to be welcomed. So from this point of view, the meritocratic elites has a very strong exit option in the terms of Hirschman, and the public started to fear that as a result of it, they don't share a common fate. And here comes the populist parties. While the meritocrats come say, listen, society is like a school. We have equal rules, some are doing better, some are doing worse, but it's fair. Then comes the populace and said, no, society is like a family. I basically care for you not because you deserve, but because you are one of my own, because this is part of my ethnic group, out of my religious group. And then the populist leader said, probably we're not as intelligent as these guys in Brussels, but we want to stay here and they're going to leave. I'm saying this because I do believe this kind of a different understanding of loyalty and the critical understanding of loyalty is something that probably you as a generation are going to face. In his famous exit voice and loyalty, Hirschman in fact did not conceptualize much more of loyalty. For him, it was taken for granted. He believed that it's very difficult for people to change their face. He believes that it's almost impossible to change the party for which you're voting. He believes that divorce is a big issue. But we're living in a world in which the exit option became much easier. And from this point of view, how to redefine loyalty in the way, basically, to make, uh, 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 to make this meritocratic elite legitimate in the eyes of the voters, in my view, is something uh, extremely important. Otherwise, we're going to end up in a situation which very beautifully is described in a film by the famous uh, Russian movie director, uh, Zvyagintsev. The movie is called Elena, and it tells a very simple story. There is this kind of a rich, older man who married this woman who was a nurse, and basically she's taking care of him. They have a separate lives, they have a separate interest, they're living together. She has a family. 
and her son is not doing well, and her grandson is not doing well, she's using any free time and any money in order to help them. And at some point, the grandson needs money in order to avoid going to the army. He goes to her husband, and he said, he does not deserve it. This young boy is doing nothing. He's just wasting his time, he's playing uh, games, he's playing on his computer, I'm not going to give him the money, why should I give the money? At the end of the film, she basically put Viagra in uh, his medicine and killed him. So the idea of being killed by Viagra is something that meritocratic elites really can face in this type of a revolt against it. Uh, but I do believe, and here I want to end, I do believe on the other side that you are very much lucky uh, because you are going to face intellectually a time when, when all major questions are going to be asked again. So probably you're going to have a great opportunity to give better answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ivan. So I take you from what I heard that you are not a person who believes that a little bit of PR and communication strategy can save Europe and globalization. You're right. Because that's what I hear in Brussels all the time, that we're communicating lousily. Uh, this comes, by the way, this is one of the things that you're going to understand, that political party or any institution or company has a problem, when they do believe that the only problem they have is a communication problem. <laughs> they believe that if they're going to explain better, people are going to agree. That's not it then. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, but uh, we're going to open up, and I particularly encourage students to go ahead and ask questions. Since, please tell us also your country of origin, since it's your first time here, we don't know you, and Ivan also wants to get a flair of, uh, of who is here. Don't feel afraid to push, I mean, you know, I pre we presented you an intellectual. Don't be afraid to ask for solutions as well, right? Because we heard that uh, a little bit of compassion wouldn't be good, but then you scared us off telling us that populists are so compassionate. So, you know, I think that they are more compassionate than us. Can we really beat them in this game? So where, where are the solutions to look from? So please, you start in blue, please. My name is Jan Jakub I'm uh, from Poland and I'm a PhD student. I have two questions. The first on meritocracy. Do you think that part of the solution could be political engagement or maybe a certain type of political engagement on part of the meritocratic elite. On fragility, what do you think should be the policy of a public policy school in reaction to fragility? These are two great yeah, questions. Th th Let's thank go you very now. Much. And yeah, yeah. Look. Thank you very much. It's really great questions. Listen, if you go back to Hirschman, for him the difference between the sphere of economics, the market, and the political sphere is exactly the problem of loyalty. Voices that you are trying to change things which are so daring for you that you are not simply going to exit. And from this point of view, I do believe there was a moment in which the idea was that the political engagement, the political commitment doesn't much matter. It matters. By the way, if you see now when you talk about the leadership and the crisis of leadership, what kind of a professional leadership became so much respected by the general publics all over the world. Military, particularly in the countries that have a real military. Uh, what is happening in the United States, if it was Russia, we're going to call it the rise of Siloviki. Why? Because this is the elites who has two characteristics. Sacrifice, it's not their intelligence only. Nevertheless, by the way, intellectually, some of American elites, particularly military elites, are one of the most impressive I have seen. But secondly, they care about their people. They're always going to say, my boys, who are you going to hear the head of a bank to talk about his stuff as my boys or my girls? This type of a very deep connection of people who share a common threat. And I do believe this is important because this type of a political commitment, I do believe people are starting to recognize it. And it has something to do with your second question on fragility. I have been studying a lot the, dis the disintegration of Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. So from this point of view, I, everybody was an expert on integration, I was an expert of disintegration. I know how things collapse. And normally they collapse as an unintended consequence. But what you get as a result of it is that when you have a choice between being rigorous and being flexible, 
be flexible. Don't try to create a situation in which not changing the rules is becoming the religion. I know that for the German public it could be very difficult. <laughs> uh, uh, no, no, and I'm saying without irony. But in a certain way, the problem of a major crisis is not the problem of victory, it's the problem for surviving. Because after you're going to survive, you're going to have a reconstellation, you're going to have a different type of opportunities. But in a certain way, flexibility and how to teach people in the policy schools to be policy flexible, not morally, policy flexible, to see different ways, to try to, try to accommodate particularly certain type of political trends, I find critically important. Because otherwise, if you stay in a certain way, on certain positions that you are not ready to renegotiate, you're making the situation much more easily to be break down. Uh, and this is why I have a, if there is one thing that comes naturally to me in all this conversation with policy people, by the way, the politicians know this better than the experts. You should try to find not the best answer, but the best answer that can be politically sold now. Because if you manage to do it, to, tomorrow you're going to have a chance for a different type of configuration. If it's going to fail, then basically you're not going to have a room for maneuvering. So this is why, but teaching a flexibility, both in business schools and in policy schools, is not easy. Because in a certain way, what people are taught is institutional design. They're taught kind of a... a how the system should work. And I do believe from this point of view it could be a challenge because living in time of crisis, I do believe political flexibility is becoming critically important that I'm sure that Hert is going to find a way to do it because I'm not sure that many of uh, the schools are doing this. So not prescriptions, but rather yeah. flexibility, yeah, yeah, right? Not yeah. one rule yeah. also. Okay, more. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Tim Stadas. I'm from Germany. I'm one of the first, first year MPP students. Uh, I have one or two questions. Um, in your book, you outline that meritocracy won't be mm, the tool to solve problems in Europe. On the other hand, you also oppose um, public referendums, so bottom-up democracy. So uh, is the solution in between, and okay. what would it look like? And on the other hand, the second, maybe more personal question is, um, you, as I take it, have personally benefited quite a lot from what you would call the, the bigger world and, yeah. the, and the united Europe. Uh, on Sunday, there's another Pulse of Europe uh, venture, I think, here in, here in Berlin, where people really feel alliance and display alliance to the European Union. Do you feel something like that as well? Yeah. Okay. Let's start with the second one. Listen, if there is a generation that really benefited out of the opening, this was our generation. It's very difficult to explain to you how big the change was. Uh, just to give you uh, two things, and this is not in terms of... For three or four years after 1989, I had a very strong feeling any time when I was crossing a border. This does not exi this exists in many countries in the third world, and we see how people... But in Europe, this has... Uh, my daughter, basically, she cannot understand what I'm talking about. Uh, you go, and you cannot imagine what it means to be 25-year-old Bulgarian going on a fellowship to Oxford and understanding first that your English is not English. Because you... <laughs> no, no, but this... Do you know, and this is... It's not simply because my lack of talent for languages, but because we have been studying English without uh, native English speakers. So this is a totally parallel world. Secondly, you start to discover how interesting things they are in the world. So we benefited a lot. Because we benefited a lot, and I do believe this was part of the problem of uh, the social sciences and European discourse, in biology it's very well known that when you see two things, with one eye something that is moving and with the other something that is not moving, you see only the moving part. So we very much focused on things that changed and moved on people like me. But there are people for whom the life does not change so much. And I'm not talking only about incomes. One of the things that is happening in Central Europe today is a certain type of a reconsideration of what was the effect of the exodus of people out of the countries. Uh, and here you should know that there is no positive correlations between the economic performance of the country and the percent of the population that left. For the last 10 years, one of the countries where you have the highest percent of people who left are the Baltic republics, which economically are doing fine. Why I'm saying this? I'm saying this because suddenly you start to realize that the place in which you are 
looks kind of without value because everybody wants to leave. Uh, you have the feeling that, for example, the more Bulgarian invests in education and the better students we produce, in a certain way we're going to invest in the German economy because it's easier for these people to come and to work here. Uh, so as a result of it, you start to face all these paradoxes. So we benefited a lot. And you cannot imagine how much our societies have changed. Probably for some societies, it's, it's different, as you know. But, but I do believe, and then I go to your second question. I easily can understand where this fascination with uh, direct democracy comes. In the political science, the debates on the referendum is one of the oldest and very well known. I'm not going to give, but uh, European Union cannot function as a union of referendums for a very simple reason. The referendum is the final decision. And European Union is very much a negotiating space. So from this point of view, nevertheless, that I'm ready to accept, particularly on certain issues, the importance of the referendums I don't believe that European Union, from this point of view, have the same logic as a nation state. And what I'm really afraid is not the Brexit type of referendums. Listen, I don't like Brexit. I like European Union, and I do believe that for countries, for example, like Bulgaria, the disintegration of the European Union is going to be an ultimate disaster. But on the other side, at least, this is you know, out. What I really fear is a different type of referendums, small and nasty referendums in which certain type of an active minorities are trying to paralyze the policy process in order to show that Europe does not work. For example, there was in Netherlands a referendum on the Ukrainian EU Trade Association Treaty. Do you believe that the Dutch citizens have been waking up reading this treaty? Do you believe that this is the most existential thing that happens in their life? No. But the idea was we are going to use it as a proxy in order to show that the European Union has a problem. Then you go to Mr. Orban's referendum in Hungary. Listen, in Hungary, on migration, there is a consensus. It's a negative. We don't want foreigners. Why then you go on a referendum? Normally, you go on the referendum where you don't know where the public stands. But you go on the referendum exactly because you know where the public stands. The good story about the public is that you can never rely on it. So he didn't manage to get the majority for this because people simply didn't like the trick. Because he wanted to send a message to Brussels. So from this point of view, the manipulative nature of the referendum, particularly when you are trying to ask people to answer a question in which they are not existentially involved, is a huge issue. Does it mean that I'm against referendum in principle? No. There are certain issues on which I do believe this is things that work. I, don't, I do believe it's like slightly with the nuclear weapon should not be used as a conventional weapon. <laughs> you can use it on some important issue, but not all the time. There was a beautiful Romanian science fiction story, uh, which I remember from the 1980s. And this was a story of a society in which they decided to keep their governments accountable. So at the moment when the president is elected, they're putting a bomb in his body. And every citizen has a device. <laughs> so when he takes a decision, the citizen can vote yes and no. And if three times the no's are more than yes, he explodes. <laughs> and the idea was that it's going to be a very accountable democracy. I'm sure that it's very accountable. The only thing that I'm not sure it's a democracy, but otherwise, <laughs> yeah. Just to follow up on this coming back, Martin, I have, I have to tell you, Ivan, that I heard today from a Bulgarian student of mine who is Bulgarian. His name is Martin. He returned to Sofia, and he wrote to me today that he's going to work in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs because Bulgaria has EU presidency next year, sure. and he is already working on three different committees on that. So, you know, some people do return. Also, on Romania's EU presidency, there are two former Herty students that are working very active. We also have people to return through Colombia and who work on the OECD application of, of Colombia and lots of, other, lots of other examples of this. So you don't think that the example of Macron of putting, you know, technocrats and civil society activists together can perhaps help us a little bit? No, I do believe, first of all, people are coming. And to be honest, these people who are coming, they're highly respected exactly because of the choice that they made. Secondly, of course, I should tell you a joke because this is why what we Bulgarians are professionalized in. Uh, uh, and the joke is uh, three persons dressed like uh, Japanese samurais are walking on the streets of Sofia. And bystander looked at them and said, who are you? They said, we are the seven samurais and we are here to make this country a better place. 
but why are you only three? The other four are working abroad. Uh, I, I'm, saying, I'm saying this because the problem of particularly of some of the small countries is the critical mass. <laughs> critical mass is extremely important. And from this point of view, it's very important. If five persons are going to come back, they are not five. They are changing basically and creating a very strong impact on many others. It does not mean that people who are out are better than people who are in. This is not true, by the way. But the very idea that they are coming back, they are sending a message that this place is important for them. The value of the place. And I do believe it's quite important because the idea that uh, countries of Eastern Europe are going to be changed simply uh, through the regulations coming from Brussels. Even if 10 years ago, some people could believe in it, now they know that this is not the case. And even more, at the moment when people start to know that this is their place and to fight for it, uh, the change is much more dramatic. Just to give you one example, when the constitutional reform was pushed in Poland, I was following very closely the opinion polls. The majority of the polls rejected the reforms of the constitutional court. At the same time, they rejected the possibility that Brussels is going to decide. And I do believe this is important. I see this as a positive development. They're going to say this is wrong, and it is us who are not going to allow this to happen. It's not simply going to be because there are going to be certain regulations and others. Because any regulation which is lacking political constituency to stay for it, after a certain period of time, is going to be weakened and basically twisted, and it's not going to play the role. At least from this point of view, uh, as you say, I, I much more believe in the political nature of the decisions. It's not enough. And being in a country uh, where to basically vote a law is the easiest thing that you can do. I remember an Albanian colleague who said, if the condition for getting the European Union is to vote this thousand of laws, we can do it in three days. Uh, so the easiest with which you're voting a law shows basically the weakness of the political environment. And this is where I do believe now part of the problem comes from. Thank you. I think line three on the left and then on the right. Um, hi, my name's Harry, I'm from the UK. Um, just going back to the idea of meritocracy, um, do you think that populists have cap kind of capitalised on a general rejection of the idea of a meritocracy or capitalised on a kind of dis disenfranchi disenfranchisement sorry, uh, from a meritocracy and people feeling that they have no access to the elite? So not so much with the idea of the meritocracy, but the idea that it's a kind of closed shop masquerading as a meritocracy in places where populists are popular. Uh, j just very quickly, because uh, there was some interesting data on United Kingdom, which came after Brexit. Listen, one of the major things that happened in our societies, particularly in the British society, is the incredible rise of people with the university education. And this is extremely important. If you see basically even 40 years ago, what was the percent of the people doing a manual jobs in the United Kingdom, you're going to be surprised how quickly was the change. But because of it, because of this success, in a certain way, non-university graduates started not to be interesting to anybody on the political side. In a certain way, they became irrelevant. It's not simply disfranchising, but they're basically perceived as somebody whose time has gone, who has nothing much to say, something of the past. And then you have a revolt which was very much electoral because you see to what extent, for example, education was a dividing line uh, in, the, in the Brexit vote. I do believe that you easily can say they are not real meritocrats. But who are the real meritocrats? Most of these people, to be honest, do it a decent way. They went, they studied, they, uh, in a certain way, uh, made a huge effort to achieve what they have achieved. The problem came, and this was very clear during the financial crisis, during the talk about the bonuses of the bankers. There are people here which I do believe know much more than this. Uh, but part of the argument coming from the bankers was, it's not about money, they said. But we earned them. This was, it's not simply that they have big money, but this is recognition of our contribution. We want to be respected because this is the way we're respected. And people are looking at them and said, to be respected for what? How we benefit from the fact that you're so professional? If you're so good, why we're not doing well? And I do believe this idea of what success means in these different social groups is quite important. Success cannot be reduced simply kind of the peer opinion. This is also true, by the way, in the academic circles. It's very important to be really appreciated by your colleagues who deeply know what you're doing. 
But it does not mean that you can ask the general public to basically take this for granted and that you're not going to be attacked for this or that by this, because the question is how I'm benefiting from your expertise, how I'm benefiting from your professionalism. So this is, yeah, uh, this is at least my feeling of this. Uh, my name is Toma Pavov, and I happen to be yeah. from Bulgaria. Um, I had the opportunity to travel a lot and go back home maybe twice a year. And every time I'm back for a week or two, um, and I talk to my parents, grandparents, I get this, um, this feeling that they're nostalgic of the past, of what, or certain aspects of the past, of how during communism the society seemed to be more equal. In, although I try to tell them, but now we have all those opportunities to go to places to get education abroad, I still can't even wrap my head around. So what is the alternative to the present system? So I just wonder, seeing what's happening in Russia, in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe, in the United States, how do you see um, the future in the coming 10 years or five years? As, as hard as it is to, to project it, but I just wonder. It's given your global outlook and seeing the current trends. There, well, a, there is a famous American coach who used to say it's very difficult to predict, particularly the future. Uh, uh, but uh, no, but let's go on this. You're right about nostalgia, but don't forget, nostalgia always exists. Uh, because nostalgia is about your time when you were young, when you have been full of opportunities. It's very interesting that nostalgia is there, but if you basically go and try to see what of what existed in the previous regime, people want to come back they're going to be shocked that somebody is going to tell them what to do and so on and so on. So I do believe that part of the strength of the nostalgia, nostalgia comes because there is no alternative. People cannot imagine how to change the society in the way to fit what basically they discuss. And from this point of view, particularly about Eastern Europe, uh, my psychological interpretation is to understand some of the developments of Eastern Europe these days, the emergence of certain governments like the Polish and the Hungarian one. Think about East Europeans like a second generation of migrants. Because for the last 25 years, Eastern Europe migrated to the West. Some do it individually, but most with their countries. And this was, I mean, literally migrated. We adopted legislation, we moved, and so on. The first generation of migrants, people like Havel and Geremek, they wanted to show that they're better Europeans than Europeans. The second generation, in a certain way, is more Europeanized, but they start to see the ceiling glass, they start to talk about the second uh, uh, class uh, citizens and others. This, in my view, is slightly a natural process. And this is why I'm not so much afraid that if we manage to keep the frame and if we manage to create the political dynamics, I'm not so much afraid that this is going to, uh, to be as destructive as some people believe. Because there is no there is a new kind of a, a, a new leftist generation. This is an interesting, I'm staying part of my time in Vienna in the Institute for Human Sciences. What I'm seeing, and this is very natural, probably is the same here. The generation of the young scholars that come to us are much more on the left uh, than our generation was. Uh, I mean, as a general consensus on things. It's not about individual politics. But the most interesting is that they're getting certain type of an ideas that have been developed, for example, in the 1970s, but they're not very much interested in the context of this, for which these ideas have been developed. So now we started to do things that probably are going to look strange for somebody. We started to invite some of the old figures of the 1970s to come back to the Institute for uh, months or two, in order at least these people to know the origins of these ideas. Because funnily enough, most of these ideas have been created from the people coming from the far left to the left. And now basically the same ideas I get from the people who are moving from the center to the left. Uh, and it's quite interesting. Uh, I do believe that this is intellectually, I find this a very natural process. And to be honest, uh, some of the most interesting people that we have. Uh, but this is also based on a different experience. And if there is one category which I do believe we are not very good to make use of in our studies, it's not so much. On institutions, there is a lot of written. There was a talks about interest. There is a lot of studies about values. Experiences matters. In a certain way, we are very much the product of certain type of experiences. And how to try to integrate this type of experience perspective in our studies, at least for me, is something which is 
a major challenge, particularly in the time of a big data, where you don't need much theory, but you, because you have a lot of data. Um, hi, my name is Sofia. I'm from Portugal. I'm a first year MPP student. I'm right here. Oh, exactly. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so thank you for the Saramago mention, that was very kind. Um, I have two questions, um, which are very different, but perhaps mm, interconnected. You spoke of the crisis of, a dem of the democratic idea, but not of democracy. And I assume you meant that um, the problem aren't rules or regulations or complying with the logics of what it can constitutes a democratic process, but the idea of what democracy should mean to people. My question is, can you divorce that idea of democracy that was sold to Southern and Eastern European countries from a logic of economic prosperity that the European Union was selling? In addition, as a a southern woman that went away to study and to be um, better. Very much between inverted commas. And then chose out of principle to return to her country only to find that all the reasons, a very strange paradox that I was not able to overcome, all the reasons that I was valued when I went back were all the reasons that also discredited me when I tried to change anything or implement anything that was derived from my international experience, which was then always set in opposition to the logic of you no longer understand how we are and how we work. Thank you. This yeah. was really yeah. illustration yeah. to what Ivan yeah. was saying earlier. Yeah. So Thank you very much. Yeah, both, uh, both questions are great. This mm -hmm. Yasha Monk, uh, uh, a score uh, from Harvard, uh, did a study based on the World Value Survey that discovered that in the last 25 years, the trust in democracy as a political regime has declined in the Western countries, we're not talking about Eastern Europe, and particularly among the younger generation. So we're facing the following paradox. First of all, talk about the crisis of democracy does not make me very nervous, because if you go back to literature, the discourse on crisis is the natural discourse on democracy. Democracy is always in crisis. For example, there are not people here who remember, but uh, there was a famous German chancellor who in 1970 said that he's giving 20 more years to democracy before authoritarian regimes are going to basically govern all over. Uh, so from this point of view, what bothers me is something totally different. Democracy was never famous for solving problems, but democracy had two major advantages at the moment. One is that it's like monarchy in the 19th century. This is the only thing that people understand. If you're going to tell the people that you're going to get out of them the right to vote and to elect, these same people who are so critical about democracy and so on are going to become extremely nervous. And this is why nobody is taking the vote. I can give you a, because I, I'm doing quite a lot of Russia. Listen, you cannot understand that the major source of legitimacy of President Putin come from the fact that their elections, which we know that they're not fair, that they're not free, but people believe that if they were free and fair, he's going to win them. So from this point of view, you cannot get elections out of it. But on the other side, the second important thing about democracy is we live in a society where dissatisfaction is becoming the default option. Look even in the experience that we know shopping. You go to shopping and all these uh, big chains are allowing you to return what you have shopped in 24 days and so on. The idea of the fact that you're going to be disappointed <laughs> is very much uh, in, the, uh, 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 in the rules. From this point of view, democracy has advantage towards the non-democratic regime because this is a regime better prepared to deal with dissatisfaction. People know that they're going to be dissatisfied, <coughs> but they have an instrument to act on it. While most of those authoritarian regimes, even when they're highly performing, like China, they should satisfy. They should perform. In a certain way, it's very difficult because democratic regimes much easier go through crisis. It's not that they're naturally performing better. I never bought the idea that democracy is solving all the crises. There was such an oversell 1990s. Uh, this was, uh, no, this, no, no, because, for example, any problem that you face, and they're telling you that the answer is democracy. For example, corruption, how we're going to fight corruption in Africa, make them democratic. Listen, democracy and corruption, you can change the nature of corruption, 
but it does not need, or you're going to do this and that. So there is a certain guilt of overselling, but at the end of the day, the competitive advantage of democracy is not over. So for me, this is basically important, and this is going to be done not in the good days, but in the bad days. Machiavelli used to say something which I found very profound. He said, nevertheless, what the prince do. There are good times and bad times. And there is no prince that can avoid the bad times. The problem is how much good feeling among the people he has accumulated during the good times in order to survive the bad times. And in a certain way, this is also about democracy, about the European Union, and so on. So from this point of view, and going back to your second question, exactly this. There is an ambiguity. There is an ambiguity. All of us go. There was a time, 10, 15 years ago, when if you want to look legitimate in your success, better succeed outside of the country. If you're a great professor in Sofia University, not much respected come from Herty and they're going to tell you you're really great. Now this is starting to change. Because you come, they said you probably understand Germany, but you don't understand Bulgaria. But this type of a protectionism, which is intellectual protectionism, should not surprise us. This is like we are in a time of certain type of protectionism. People are trying to resurrect borders, not simply physical borders. They are also trade borders, but also intellectual borders. And from this point of view, the idea that my place is important and because I'm here, I understand better than you what is going on, is a certain type of a competition between different elites which are putting uh, quite a lot of... Uh, using different resources in order to claim themselves. And this is not something that should scare us. You cannot expect that you go back and people said you're better than us. Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, I think we, we, we should call it here, and I will uh, pass the floor back to, to our president for, uh, for the final words. I think Ivan said something like, uh, who comes, uh, people who come after us, they're more on the left, but I don't think you heard anything very ideological this evening, right? You heard something from the generation of human rights and of a certain type of liberalism, very close to what we teach in policy schools, where we are guided by the big slogan of Bentham, which is basically freedom and effective drainage. But as we hear from this Portugal story, there are times when freedom seems to get in the way of effective drainage, and even worse time when effective drainage gets in the way of freedom. But we have two years to solve this kind of problems together. Yeah. Thank you very much for your patience. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ivan, for a spirited and very insightful talk and for, um, I think, a very good uh, question and answer period. I'd like to thank Alina for an exquisite introduction and for fielding the questions so well, and I think for uh, the audience uh, for, for asking those very challenging and, uh, I think, difficult questions. Wouldn't you agree, Ivan? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now that we started the academic year, we might as well continue, right? Uh, the way we continue is that we all ask you to join us for a reception outside, and we can continue to debate and discuss, have a glass of wine, and some refreshments as well. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you.